All right, Dr. Brandt, I think we are good to go. All right, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, meeting of the Delta Independent Science Board. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to uh, note that in accordance with state, federal, and local guidelines to protect public health and safety in response to COVID, this meeting, which includes a seminar, will be conducted entirely <clears throat> via remote access. We will take uh, written questions and comments, and please email your public comments and questions to uh, disb at deltacouncil.ca.gov. <clears throat> in your request, uh, please indicate the agenda item in which you would like your public comment or question read. If you prefer to provide oral comments and questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom or email to the same email. Uh, and then once you are uh, acknowledged, uh, please state your um, uh, name and affiliation and, and then uh, your public comment. Let's move on to the uh, roll call and uh, have each of the board members state their full name and whether or not they have any new declarations. Uh, I am Steve Brandt, the uh, chair of the board, no new declarations. Uh, Tom? You're on mute, Tom. I'm still Tom Holzer and <laughs> no new declarations. Okay, uh, Tanya. Tanya Heikala, no new declarations. Lisa. Lisa Wanger, no new declarations. Okay, Jim. Jim McLaurin, no declarations. Joe. Joe Fernando, no new declarations. Uh, Virginia. Virginia Dale, no declarations. Okay, I think we are, uh, uh, Bob Nyman has uh, given his apologies for not being able to make it to this meeting. Jay Lund will be here um, at, uh, uh, we think he'll be joining us late. And we're also uh, expecting Diane. Diane, are you here yet? Ah, there she is. Diane, any new declarations? Oh, I have no new declarations. Sorry. Okay, uh, that's a roll call. We have a quorum. Um, the agenda is fairly simple today. We're going to have an excellent seminar on ecological forecasting. And then we'll just have reports from the uh, chair from the Delta and the science program. And then uh, talk about future meetings and how we might uh, structure those and where we might go and uh, just give a preliminary discussion on that. Um, Let's move on then to item number two on the agenda, and that is a, a seminar being given by um, Michael Dietz, who's a professor in the Department of Earth, Environmental, Earth and Environment at Boston University and author of the book Ecological Forecasting. You have seen a, a, a brief summary of what his uh, uh, credentials are. And as background for this, as you all know, the science needs assessment uh, recommendations that we are making to DPIC include uh, ecological forecasting or ecosystem forecasting as one of the primary recommendations as to how uh, one might better integrate science across agencies and across departments and using that as a sort of a framework for doing that. We've also discussed uh, ecological forecasting and the concept of harmful algal blooms. And there were some good discussions we had about looking at the differences between what, a, what is a prediction and what is a forecast and so forth. So um, Michael Dietz is also the uh, founder and chair of Ecological Forecasting Initiative, which is an international uh, grassroots research consortium aimed at fostering a community of practice around near-term ecological forecasting. And what we'll do today is uh, listen to a seminar and then uh, ask questions. And hopefully this will provide some uh, uh, solid background for us in talking about the subject, which I think will come up in, our, in, uh, in the context of future reviews and, uh, and uh, get a sort of a solid uh, basis and framework for the, for the, uh, for the topic. So uh, Michael, the floor is yours. And thanks for doing this. Okay. Folks can see that? Good. Awesome. Thanks. And thanks everyone uh, for having me and, and for coming to make this talk. It's really exciting to always get to, to talk with folks that are, are, you know, think of actually putting ecological forecasts into practice. 
Um, so I, I chose as my title here, 21st Century Science for 21st Century Environmental Decision Making, uh, the Challenges and Opportunity of Near-Term Iterative Ecological Forecasting. It's a mouthful. I usually don't go with titles that long, um, but I was, I was kind of inspired um, by this fairly recent USGS report from last year uh, that I helped contribute to uh, that, that had this subtitle, 21st Century Science for 21st Century Management. And I, I really think uh, this is, you know, something that ecological forecasting is going to make possible. The, the idea of really embracing what modern technology and modern science and modern, you know, observational capacities allow uh, to really think about how we do management differently, leveraging these technologies. Um, and I'll also say that the other thing that's been really exciting for me over the last few years is to see that uh, reports like this one from USGS are becoming more common. So you, USGS now has a report on forecasting. Uh, NOAA has had an ecological forecasting roadmap for a number of years. Uh, NASA has a, a roadmap that's going to be coming out very soon. Uh, the North American Carbon Program, you know, it has a, a you know, forecasting prediction, at, you know, coming out in their next report. There's a, a, a OSTP has an Earth System prediction and, and uh, component. Uh, so th this sort of focus is is becoming pr uh, much more much more common. Uh, across uh, different, particularly with federal agencies and, and smaller organizations as well, you know, becoming, you know, much more recognized uh, kind of scientific frontier and management frontier. Uh, so roadmap for today. Uh, what is a forecast? Why would we want to forecast? How do you do this? How do you build forecasts? Uh, some successful examples and then ending with some, some resources. Okay. So what is a forecast? Uh, I'm gonna take the definition uh, from this uh, paper by Clark et al in 2001, which is many of you as kind of the foundational uh, paper for the discipline uh, that defined e uh, ecological forecast as the process of predicting the state of ecosystems, ecosystem services and natural capital with fully specified uncertainties. Uh, as anyone who's taken any of my undergrad or grad classes know I am someone who is obsessive compulsive about thinking about uncertainties because I think that's really um, one of the things that's really important to what we do and one of the things that kind of separates forecasting from just running models. Uh, because forecasts, when it comes to decision making, forecast uncertainty translates to risk. And I, I am a strong believer that it is better to be honestly uncertain about a forecast uh, than to be falsely on, overconfident because false overconfidence, which often occurs when you don't include uncertainties, can really lead to poor decision making. Uh, you know, sometimes cases where you know if, if you ignore the uncertainties, you're like, oh, the model say I should do X, uh, and the model might not actually say that. It might say that, well, the mo I don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, and so I think it's you know you can translate that uh, that breadth of uh, of uncertainty into your risk management either informally or, or through formal decision science approaches. Um, so, uh, within forecasting, there's kind of two scales or two types of forecasting that we often think about. Uh, one is, is prediction, which are probabilistic statements about what will happen in the future based on what is known today. And a, a common example of a prediction would be, a, a, an everyday example would be a weather forecast. So weather forecasts take, what do we know about the atmosphere right now? And what does that imply about what we're going to see over the next uh, two weeks? And I'll contrast that with a projection, uh, which is also a probabilistic statement, but it's one that's done conditional on uh, either some sort of boundary conditional scenarios or decision alternatives. So another very common example of a projection uh, would be our climate change projection. So, so we don't actually have four, we don't have predictions of what the climate will be at 2100. We have projections conditional on different scenarios for different economic activities, human population growth, land use, things like that, emissions. Uh, so, so these are conditional on those scenarios. You can only talk about them. You can't average over the scenarios. You can talk about them, conditional on those. And, th and this is also the form that comes up a lot when you're thinking about uh, things like structured decision-making where you have different decision alternatives you're considering. Uh, so predictions tend to be short-term. Projections can be short-term or long-term. You know, Long-term climate projections, but you can also have particularly in decision making, you can often have short term projections as well. And I use forecasting as kind of the umbrella term that includes both of these activities. So why forecast? So one of the 
main arguments for forecasting is a is one about improving environmental decision making. So we are living in a time where the environment is changing. It is changing rapidly and it's changing in often into uh, ways that are are, are unprecedented or, or, or at least not precedented over the time where we have good uh, analog data. Uh, so we think about traditional environmental management was often based on concepts of stationarity and equilibrium or steady state. And we are no longer living in a steady state world. We will not be living on a steady state world. Uh, you know, the, it, you know, we're not living in a new normal. Change is the new normal. Uh, so we will expect not, things will always be moving to new conditions. So as, as things are always changing, uh, we can't rely just on you know, historical flood frequencies or historical species distributions uh, as our management objectives. Um, so if we can't rely on stationarity, I think this idea of relying on predictions or, or forecasts becomes pro progressively more and more important. And when you think about fundamentally what environmental decision making is, decisions are about what we think is gonna happen in the future uh, based on what we know today. And, and that, that essentially is what a forecast is. It's our, our best scientific understanding of what is likely to happen in the future. And so they, it really is an explicit way of informing, it's not the only way of informing environmental decision making, but it is definitely an explicit way of informing decision making and one that I think is becoming more and more important, the less and less uh, we can rely on, on historical norms and more we have to rely on, on yeah, kind of models to, to deal with multiple simultaneous changes. Uh, one thing that I've seen a lot of uh, in the work I do, so for example, I do a lot of work with NASA's carbon monitoring program, uh, that a, a lot of what ecologists have been doing over the last decade or two in terms of forecasting has been very focused on long-term projections. There's a lot of work out there making projections out to 2100 under different climate change scenarios. Uh, and this is, I think, created an unfortunate gap between a lot of the work that a lot of ecologists are doing and, and the actual needs of most uh, stakeholders and most decision makers, which are tend to be on a much shorter time scale. So this, this is specifically on carbon data, but I think this is this sort of um, observation cuts across most environmental decision making needs. Most decision makers want seasonal, subseasonal, annual data. And, and many of them don't know what to do with a projection out to 2100. They need to know what's happening now or in the new, near future. And that's something that these, this idea of near-term forecasting is designed <coughs> to address specifically. Um, the other thing that's really exciting to me is the extent to which changes in our ability to collect environmental data has really kind of opened the, the door to making near-term forecasting a reality. So we've had changes in sensor technology, the rise of, of observatories and network science, uh, revolutions in, in uh, remote sensing, which is an incredible constellation of, of resources. Uh, and then you know all, uh, another revolution in, in community science where uh, we can rely more and more on distributed data coming in from everyday uh, individuals participating in kind of these community science initiatives that all kind of make possible this idea of making predictions on shorter time scales that are more decision relevant. So here's an example from my lab of, of a, a near-term iterative forecast. In this case, is a forecast of vegetation phenology. Um, we literally run this every day. And every day we, we make projections of, of uh, vegetation status. And then we update those as new observations come in every day, in this case, using a combination of satellite remote sensing and, and phenocams, which are essentially just webcams uh, pointed at vegetation. The other thing that really excites me about this idea of near-term forecasting uh, in contrast to kind of long-term projections uh, is that it, it, it not, doesn't just improve decision-making. I think it fundamentally improves our science. Uh, so I, I spent 20 years making projections to 2100, and I've never been to 2100 to see if I'm any good at it. Uh, by contrast, if, if I'm making a, my phenology forecast, you know, I know tomorrow whether my forecast that I made today was any good or not. So you get this more continual feedback on an ongoing basis about how you're doing that lets you update your understanding, update your models, and improve. And I argue that that uh, iterative 
cycling between making forecasts and performing analyses uh, is uh, completely compatible with how we think about how the scientific method works. You know, so our, our models represent our hypotheses about how the world works. We use them to make predictions. We test those hypotheses against new data as they come in. We update that and we iterate. And so we have this potential to use near-term forecasting not just to um, improve decision making, but to, to actually learn quicker, to continually be confronting uh, reality, conf confronting our hypotheses and our models with data from reality on an ongoing basis. Uh, forecasts also for force us to be quantitative and specific, which forces us to make very falsifiable uh, predictions uh, and hypothesis tests. <coughs> uh, forecasts also have this wonderful side effect when it comes to, to robustness of science, which is that they force you to pre, essentially pre-register your what you think is going to happen. You before the future has happened, you write down and record in a public place what you think is going to happen. They're, they force you to be a priority, and they force your validation to be out of sample. You can't you can't essentially overfit to data that hasn't been collected yet, which is a way of you know making what we're doing more robust. And so I, if we put these two things together, we have this kind of iterative forecast cycle making predictions every day and it, it intersect it, the thing that I think is this wonderful win-win is this its ability to intersect with this uh, scientific learning cycle and to in, intersect with this <coughs> uh, decision making uh, in, in, in this case like an in adaptive management cycle where we use the alternatives being considered for management to drive model scenarios those so scenarios go into decision making processes the monitoring data feeds into the forecasting its system itself. And then there's also this, uh, I think, underexplored uh, possibility to, to use forecasts to, to improve the way we do the monitoring, to make the monitoring more adaptive in space and time to where that data is most valuable to our forecasts. And this figure is essentially similarly kind of summarizes this idea of this kind of yin and yang uh, between improving science and, and providing decision relevant forecasts. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important to think about uh, making forecasts is to, to be honest about the fact that early forecasts are likely to be poor, uh, but they're likely to improve in time. So this is a figure that shows the skill of the weather forecast uh, starting back in the early days of numerical weather forecasting in the 50s, in this case up through uh, about six years ago, six, seven years ago, and this skill, which can maxes out at 100%, you know, steadily improve through time. <clears throat> and that, and, you know, in the x-axis, we see changes in compute. If I put changes in sensor technology or anything like that, one thing that's noticeable about this graph is there's not jumps. We don't, we don't get better forecasts the second we get better computers. We don't get better forecasts the second we get better monitoring data. We, we have this slow and steady improvement in skill that I think is really reflecting that uh, confronting reality, confronting our models with reality every single day uh, and learning iteratively and uh, that we continually improve our skill. You know, if, if we just, if we started back in the fifties and said, oh, you know, numerical weather forecasts, they're not very good. We should stop doing that. You know, we wouldn't have had the skill we have today. Or if we said we should wait until the models are good enough uh, and then we'll start doing numerical weather forecasting, it would have never gotten good enough. So I'm, I'm a strong believer that the only way to get forecasts to be good is to start making forecasts. It's that iterative prediction itself is the way that we increase, that we make our forecasts better. So I sometimes get feedback that like I, I, folks worry that our models aren't good enough yet to make predictions. And I, I strongly believe that they will never be good enough to make predictions until we use them to make predictions. Okay, so briefly, how does some of this stuff work? Um, so there's two steps to this cycle, the forecast step and the analysis step. The forecast step is one of taking the uncertainties we have about the world right now, initial ICs, initial conditions, the current uncertainty about the current status of our systems, driver uncertainty, you know, what, what is projecting us in the future. So in a lot of ecological forecasts, those are weather forecasts, uncertainties about our model parameters and structure. We feed all of these into our model and then we make probabilistic predictions. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do that. 
I have a book that goes into lots of detail about all the different methods, the analytical and numerical methods and what you can use them. I will say that, that by, and, by large numerical methods are, are essentially this, the norm in ecological forecasts. Uh, I think this, this comic from XKCD does a great job of explaining how these numerical ensemble members methods work and that they show, we've, we've started to see these things sort of every day now in terms of when we look at weather forecasts or forecasts of hurricane tracks, you know, that you have a model that's run with samples of different representations of realities. So we're sampling our, our weather forecasts. When we drive an ecological forecast, we sample our uncertainties about the current state, uncertainties about parameters, and we just run the model thousands of times and we get thousands of predictions. One of the things we, that happens when we look at the uncertainties in those forecasts is the, the uncertainty in a forecast tends to increase with time, which makes sense. You should be, you know, if you're more confident about the future than you are about the present, you've probably done something wrong. <clears throat> the other thing we, we notice is that at, at some point, uh, this uncertainty becomes sufficiently large that we're not doing any better than chance, this kind of background or null uncertainty. And that kind of defines uh, the useful limit, the, the limit of usability or usefulness of any forecast um, in space or in time or whatever dis dimension you're forecasting. And, and if we're lucky, those overlap with uh, decision relevant time scales. And so to me, one of the interesting questions is, you know, what, what controls uh, that rate of the growth of this uncertainty, because that kind of what is essentially what controls how far in the future we can make predictions. And if we can understand those uncertainties, we can, you know, chip away at them and try to increase the skill of our forecasts and try to increase the, the useful time scan, span of these forecasts. Uh, and so this figure, uh, you can, don't worry so much about all the math as much as the fact that it use, we use a bit of math to divide the factors that affect our, our, our forecast uncertainty into internal dynamics of our system, uh, you know, how the different parts of our ecological system interact with themselves, our, our understanding of those. Uh, external force, forcing, so you know, how sensitive is um, our system to, say, changes in the weather and how, uncertainty, how certain are we about those changes in the weather. Uh, the uncertainty about the, our, our ability to constrain the parameters in our models uh, this idea of random effects, which is essentially how statisticians account for the unexplained heterogeneity and variability in natural systems. So how, how we need to account for fine scale heterogeneity and then this residual process error, the things that our models don't under explain yet. And so uh, I don't have time to go into it today, but uh, this paper that's referenced at the top goes into a lot of detail about uh, some of our expectations about what different types of ecological systems are going to be more or less predictable based on the prevalence of these sor different sorts of uncertainties for different types of ecological systems. Uh, but it's also an open question more broadly as to uh, that we're still learning about. We're still in the early days of learning about uh, which what ecological systems are going to be more or less predictable. And to me, that's a really exciting scientific frontier. Um, on the analysis step, we take this probabilistic forecast uh, and that we operate in this philosophy that these forecasts should be updated when new data becomes available. Um, so new data becomes available. We now have a forecast that's probabilistic. We have observations. We have uncertainty about them as well. And we need some way of combining our current forecast with this new observation. What we don't want to do is just throw out the forecast and use the new observation uh, because there's uncertainty in the observations as well. Uh, and we use that updated state to feed back into the model and, and update our forecasts. So we do this reconciling of the forecasts and the observations uh, using statistical analyses. And, and for much of the work that I do, we do this using a statistical theorem called Bayes' theorem, which is essentially designed for this sort of iterative updating. We're designed to say, if I have some prior understanding of the world and new information becomes available, I have a statistical theory that tells me how to combine these two pieces of information. Without diving into the details of how the stats work, qualitatively, what it what we end up is a situation where um, our updated understanding of the system is kind of weights the, the information that we get from these two things. And so if we have data that's very imprecise, this green blob here being very broad, then our, our updated understanding of the system largely you know, sticks with what the forecast was. It might nudge a little bit towards the new data. So we don't Forecasts shouldn't be derailed by noisy, new noisy data. Uh, by contrast, if we have 
tightly constrained data and, and a model that's very uncertain, then our updated understanding of the system should move uh, much closer to the new data. Uh, one important thing that we've no learned from Bayes' theorem, though, is that the fusion of the model and the data uh, is always going to be more precise than either alone. So it's a wonder wonderful thing here about doing this iterative forecasting is our understanding of the system is always going to be better having done it uh, than just relying on, on pure monitoring data. The other thing that's really, I think, powerful about these data fusion algorithms that underlie this kind of iterative updating is they're really good at combining multiple pieces of information as well. So uh, I have a terrestrial carbon bias. Uh, and so I, I think about things like how I can uh, use mo forecast models as a way, kind of as a scaffold for combining satellite data and detailed physiological data in uh, observational data and experimental data and monitoring data that I have different ways of confusing multiple sources of information together within these uh, iterative forecasting frameworks. Uh, and to kind of show that the, the mathy side of that, you know, if I have a prediction uh, where two things that I'm predicting co-vary, let's say the carbon flux on the landscape, conifer vegetation on that landscape, uh, and if I make an observation for one of those things, that's this data here, I get to update that as we talked about using Bayes' theorem, but I also get to update everything it co-varies with. So I can actually improve my understanding of things that I don't actually observe directly based on uh, the, this covariance structure within these forecasting models. And it also works both ways and allows us to fuse information. Okay, that was a, a, a very quick summary of, of the, the how. Literally, there are numerous textbooks on this, <laughs> numerous take whole courses on this. Uh, what I want to do next is, is kind of talk more about uh, some of the examples of, of some of the forecasts that are, are out there today. Uh, so ecological forecasting is, is, to me, an exciting area for all the reasons I've talked about before, but also because it is an area that touches all parts of, of the discipline of ecology. Um, and so we are seeing forecasts popping up uh, across the breadth of the discipline. This, these pictures represent areas that we're seeing uh, forecasts running these days from, you know, uh, you know, algal blooms to coral bleaching to infectious disease to soil health to, you know, disturbances like wildfire, uh, managed populations, uh, all the way to, you know, doing forecasts synchronous with experimental manipulations. Uh, I have a friend at, at uh, uh, Stony Brook who's li literally forecasting penguin populations in Alaska using uh, data from, from NASA satellites. I, I don't think it's a cooler project in the world than forecasting penguins from space. Uh, <laughs> uh, folks in the Southwest forecasting uh, you know, drought mortality. You know, it's really uh, spanning uh, everything and, and really provides us a way of, of kind of bringing a community together and seeing commonalities uh, in the predictability of systems and a lot that we can learn about ecology on the fine scale, but also on the broad scale. Uh, to dive into things that, some examples that I thought this community would be interested in. Uh, so a couple West Coast examples, the uh, folks at uh, NOAA's Monterey office are, are running EcoCast, which is essentially a fisheries bycatch uh, forecast for the West Coast that combines uh, information about uh, the, the spatial range of different potential bycatch species, such as blue sharks and sea lions and leatherback turtles and swordfish and stuff like that, and how they, all of them are moving dynamically in space and time. Uh, and, and this team, this ecocast team in particular, has been a very strong uh, advocates of this, the idea of, of dynamic uh, preserves, the idea that we shouldn't just draw a box around an area and say, this is where the, 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 the preserve is, as much as the idea that these preserves should be shifting in space and time as the species themselves are shifting. Um, and that they actually are, are, are sending out alerts to the, the fishers uh, every day uh, the, who get updated maps like this. They, they're actually using in practice uh, to make fishing decisions. And it's interesting that, that there's no actual federal legislation requiring them to make use of these 
these forecasts yet that they've adopted them because they are actually useful. They, they are helping them avoid bycatch and target their target species better. Um, here's a, a, a one of many uh, harmful algal bloom forecasts that exists around the world. Uh, NOAA runs a number of them as well. Um, and then on the far uh, right is a, a, a endangered species uh, forecast, and this is specifically for Atlantic sturgeon. This is the uh, this is the Delaware uh, basin on the east coast, uh, and these are uh, forecasts of risk encounter. And 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 all all of these examples are, are forecasts that are literally updated every single day. Uh, Another one that I, I thought would be interesting to this community, uh, and it's it's a really one that I think is really exciting, is the the smart and connected water systems uh, uh, forecast system being de developed primarily by folks at Virginia Tech, where they have what they call the the smart reservoir project. So they have a reservoir uh, that's highly instrumented, and uh, they have been making forecasts. Uh, through time, they started with these kind of core forecasts of water temperature and lake turnover. Um, and so here, this animation shows uh, the fall forecast of, of lake turnover and, and, and lake systems. This turnover uh, tends to um, increase the turbidity of the system. It, it re uh, suspends sediments, and those sediments will bring with them nutrients, it will bring with them heavy metals. And so, you know, it's a big water quality. Uh, event and uh, so you know, any lead time that the reservoir managers can get helps them, you know, make uh, proactive management decisions. So you know, if, if they can know that a, a turnover event's coming seven days in advance, they can, you know, order supplies. If they know it's coming a few days in advance, they can, you know, change uh, the scheduling of of who needs to be on what shifts or or even where the water is coming from. Shift water from one reservoir to another. Um, and these, the, the Virginia Tech team is successfully getting forecasts uh, um, one to two weeks in advance of these turnover events, uh, which also, you know, is great for them because they can then actually go out and do intensive monitoring around those turnover events rather than just equally spacing them uh, through time. Uh, since getting this initial biophysical forecast up and running of water temperature and, and lake turnover, uh, which actually uh, the other thing that I really like about this example is one where they, they've been working very closely with the reservoir managers uh, from the get-go. So the, again, this is an example where the managers get a daily forecast to work with um, that has the uncertainties and they've worked to design the alerts that that, that, that community specifically needs. Um, and, and it's been so successful that the uh, reservoir managers actually turned over uh, operations of the oxygen oxygenation system for the reservoir to the um, to the research team who who've actually used this uh, to kind of optimize the oxygenation levels of the, the lake, but also to run some experiments uh, about things like uh, you see this. There's this methane forecast on this list as well. It turns out there's trade-offs between you know uh, oxygenation that uh, affects uh, the risk of algal blooms, but then also has, uh, trades off with uh, carbon storage capacities. So there's no there's no one best solution. Uh, but yeah, since they, they've since added phytoplankton forecasts, methane emission forecasts, dissolved oxygen and, and dissolved organic matter forecasts, and uh, the ones here are student. Those are not published yet. These are all things that, that these graduate students and postdocs are are actively working on that have that have been ramped up. Um, some of the stuff that fits hits particularly close home to me, uh, I my lab runs uh, forecasts of the soil microbiome across uh, the, the US, uh, showing that we can increase predictability uh, across spatial scales and phylogenetic levels. Uh, we more recently started doing these uh, through time, and these are driven largely by NEON data. Uh, my, my lab runs forecasts of, of ticks and tick-borne disease. Um, they're updated uh, as new data becomes available. Uh, this is an interesting case because our, our forecasts of the actual tick population is very different than the forecasts of, of observations because we don't, we have this uh, capture probability problem. And so what we only, we only ever get to see the ticks we capture. And th this is a very common problem in fisheries as well. You know, you, you only see a subset of the organisms you're capturing you in the, the 
the population itself is is unobserved and, and latent. Um, so uh, you, that la this one just shows for the larvae, we were actually able to capture order of magnitude variability in, in shifts as population shifts as well. Uh, my lab runs a uh, carbon and water flux forecast between the land and the atmosphere. Again, this sh sends out daily email alerts of carbon flux, water flux, and uh, leaf area, and so a moisture. Essentially, it's a it's a daily forecast of, of plant water stress and carbon sequestration capacity. <clears throat> and this is a system that started as a series of, of site level forecasts and working with NASA carbon monitoring, we're, we're in the process of scaling this up to uh, continental carbon forecasts. We've got a carbon hindcast running. So this, we've run it historically and we're in the process of pushing it to kind of a real time system. Okay, uh, last thing I wanna talk about was uh, resources. Uh, and so something that came up in the, in the introduction was this idea of the Ecological Forecasting Initiative which is an organization that we launched a couple of years ago that is specifically to build a community of practice around ecological forecasting. And it, it is a broadly interdisciplinary community. So it includes ecologists and social scientists and computational scientists and nat physical environmental scientists, uh, decision scientists. Uh, it is also a, um, a diverse community in terms that it includes academics, it includes agency folks, it includes NGO folks and includes a small but hopefully growing number of, of folks in industry. So it is aiming to bring these communities together uh, and, and realize that a lot of the problems that we have in making ecological forecasts, even though they are very diverse in their applications, have a lot of common cross-cutting challenges. So EFI is organized around the common cross-cutting themes and some of them are, are technical like methods in cyber infrastructure and decision methods. Uh, and some of them are, are about education and broadening the community and bringing more built kind of capacity building. Um, we have a lot of educational resources up on our website. There's videos, uh, there's uh, course materials. There's, I mentioned the book earlier. We run a, a summer course every year. Uh, as a community, we're also working on developing community scale cyber infrastructure. So, so the, the computational workflow tools to support ecological forecasts so that not everyone is reinventing uh, the workflows to be able to run these forecasts. Uh, we mentioned some of the works we've been doing with uh, a wide range of partners. I mentioned earlier, uh, NASA, OSTP, NACP, stuff like that. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing right now also that we're really excited about is we're running an open forecasting challenge using data from NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network. Uh, and there's like 56 teams from around the world participating in this challenge of predicting uh, these five different things listed in the bottom uh, as a way of kind of building the community, but also uh, you know, developing algorithms. Uh, and so this, my last slide, just showing some of the resources that FE provides. Uh, there's a lot, these are some of the other things on our website. Uh, you know, uh, task uses information about technical tools lessons learned, you know, ethics, research to op operations, things like that. Uh, blogs highlighting different forecasting projects. Uh, we have a community Slack, community newsletter, social media, and, and a GitHub repository where, where we're putting this community cyber infrastructure. Uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for having me. I know that was kind of whirlwind, um, and a, but hopefully a nice sampling of some of the things that the community, the folks in the community are working on and, and some of the really exciting frontiers for ecological forecasting. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Michael. Uh, there's a round of applause that you can't hear, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's exactly what we uh, we wanted to hear. And it looks like there's a lot of other resources out there that uh, uh, that we need to explore in terms as we push this uh, uh, effort forward. Uh, and I want to also, uh, before we get started, welcome Jay to the uh, to the board meeting and. Uh, um, and start off with uh, board questions. Any members of the board have uh, questions? Uh, Joe. Well, one of the, I mean, certainly thank you very much for the very interesting and, and nice talk. It's just the overview uh, is, is quite intriguing. One, one question is these are very difficult problems and uh, the, the kind of mathematical 
base you are using to do this has certain uncertainties. So it's a lot of uncertainties are accumulating as you showed. Now, any kind of effort to compare your forecast with data and do some data assimilation type things while, while you are going? That's my first question. The second question is that, can you do some thoughts of application of this type of framework to Delta? Yeah, so, so the first part's the easier part for me. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of us are using these iterative data simulation techniques. We are essentially, you, know, you, you get to compare your, uh, your forecast to new observations every single day. So, so often models are built on some calibration data set, uh, but you know, the, the models are updated continually as, as new information becomes available. So they're constantly learning. Uh, and one of the things I think is, is exciting here is, is um, a paper I've been working on showing that you can start you can start with you know, kind of an ensemble of multiple models that range from very, very simple, say linear models to more complex mechanistic models and show that you know, you know, as you increase the amount of information you have about any process over time, you iteratively learn not just about the, the states of your system and the parameters in your models, but uh, you know, even you, you learn about what model structures make best. And it you know, makes you forecast with simple models early, but those models can grow in complexity uh, but we can do that continuously. We don't, you know, traditional model building might, you know, you, you go out and measure something for five years and then you update your model. Uh, this is, I, I think the exciting thing here is the ability to do this continuously. Um, in terms of the Delta itself, I'll, I'll admit that I uh, am not a, a wetland or coastal uh, or, or river ecologist by training. I, it's something I've, I feel like since we have started, since we've launched FE, I've, I've started working much more with aquatic ecologists than I ever did before. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think there, there's you know, lots of different places uh, to think about this uh, on the population side, you know, are there uh, managed species that are important to you, you know, fishery species, threatened or endangered species. Uh, there are folks are doing uh, ecological forecasts for invasive species uh, as well. Uh, and then there's a lot of folks doing uh, forecasts on the kind of ecosystem and biogeochemical side. So forecasting not just water flow, but the, the nutrients in the water, uh, you know, the flows coming in, turnovers within systems. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, I think that uh, some of the most successful forecasts are the ones where there is some form of continual data coming in though. Uh, things that can be measured by sensors are, are low hanging fruit but things where there's monitoring campaigns in place so that you have that data uh, to continually check about, check against uh, on populations and stuff like that, you know, that's, can, you know, can make, you know, we're definitely running population forecasts as, as well as a community. Thank you. Uh, I lost track of what order the hands went up. <laughs> Lisa, go ahead. Well, I may, may have been late to the game here, so I apologize if I'm getting in front of other folks. Um, I'm, I'm curious about how you've enabled this great progress. So I'm really glad to see this. You know, I happen to be aware that, that NEON was a little slow out of the starting gate. So the question is, did you have to get a sort of a certain amount of data that enabled this network or what really enabled this network? Um, so, so EFI as a network itself doesn't produce the forecast. It's the members of the community within the forecast, the it's more that we, we've brought a community together uh, and, and often allowed folks that were thinking about these things by themselves to realize that there actually is a pretty big community of folks uh, thinking about it now. So, you, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, here I show that we have a Slack. There's almost 400 people on that Slack now. Uh, so the community able to share information uh, about what's going on. We've got, you know, a dozen active working groups tackling the challenges that the community shares. Um, you know, and new chapters popping up. We, have, we launched a Canadian chapter a couple of years ago in the process of launching an Australian chapter. You know, so it's, it's, for us, it's about building community, building, bringing people under the umbrella and helping them realize that we were all working in on the same problems, but weren't often aware of it because of silos, because of the fact that someone you know, developing great techniques for you know, forecasting the next emergent ep epidemic disease has the same mathematical problem as the person you know, forecasting the next invasive species and didn't know that they were working on the same, you know, essentially the same problem. Uh, 
Uh, and so I think it's that sharing, that building of community and sharing strength that's been really valuable. And I think it's, it's kind of why we've seen kind of a sprint of activity over the last few years relative to what came before it. Uh, I think the data revolution in ecology is also really fueling this, the fact that we have better monitoring data than we've ever had before. Okay, I see uh, <clears throat> hands up for Virginia, then Jay, then Tanya, and then Diana. Uh, so thank you. This has been a great presentation and you covered a whole lot really fast. Um, I was particularly interested in backcasting. You briefly mentioned the word hindcasting, but I found this really useful to test hypothesis and particularly where events are rare in time or space, which is not what you're talking about, but what can be important in the Delta. Could you talk about that a minute? Yeah, I mean, I, I think hindcasting and backcasting has been a valuable part of uh, the model, valuable the modeling community has used for, for a very long time. I think some of the things that we've, at, you know, so one of the things that, that we're adding that's new is, so for example, in our, our carbon monitoring hind casting, um, we're doing this as a formal reanalysis where we're not just running a model and then seeing what happened, but we were running a model in this iterative updating mode uh, in order to come up with what the best estimates of the state of the system were in the past. Uh, that helps us with you know, closing budgets, combining multiple pieces of information, and then gives us a, a composite data so, uh, product that helps us understand the variability uh, in space and time. I'll also say, I, I didn't go into it in great detail, uh, but um, when we think about projections, conditional on decision alternatives or scenarios, uh, Projections are also the place that folks in the forecasting community use to deal with rare events. So, uh, you know, sometimes these are called war games. So, so when you have events that are sufficiently rare uh, that you can't ascribe a hard probability to them, that you can include dynamically in the forecast, you can still run them as scenarios in that mode. And so, so a lot of forecasting for low probability events are done uh, in that mode. And, and in that case, you know, it's it's kind of widely acknowledged that the, the limits one of the key limits for those low probability events are, have always been failures of imagination. Uh, you know, so, so you know, forecasts fail when events happen that we didn't anticipate and didn't include in those sets of scenarios. Because yeah, it's very hard to include them in models as things we're predicting dynamically if they, if they don't happen. If we've never seen them before, they happen you know, very, very rarely. Okay, Jay. Thank you, Michael, for, for really a great talk. I'm sorry I missed the very beginning of it because I was in class. The, um, the thing that I really enjoyed about your presentation was the discussion about how you need to start modeling before you have a model that works and, and how over, over the course of your model not working, you can make it work better. Uh, we, you, I think, are saddled in, in this system and in many places with um, sort of a more traditional ecologist view of these matters where, oh, after we've collected 40 years worth of data and hypothesis testing, maybe we will know enough we can start to build a model rather than what I think of as an engineering view where you start off building a model and then you know what data to collect and you use that data that you collect to improve the model. And I really appreciate that. I think that's a, a major lesson for us here. Thank you very much. Uh, no problem. I don't know if there was a question there, but I'll just say that yeah, we, we have done Sorry. We have done a lot of the sorts of activities that you kind of alluded to there, where we, where you can actually mathematically say, um, you know, given the model structure I have and its current uncertainties, you know, what is the most next most valuable pieces of information? So, so we've done these sorts. Of, you can easily do these uncertainty analyses to say, you know, the first, you know, of those five dominant uncertainties, which one dominates any particular forecast, and then you know, within that, what are the processes and parameters, and, and then how you can design. Field campaigns. And we have a couple examples in my lab where we've, we've done these very targeted field campaigns driven by detailed analyses of forecast uncertainty. And, you, and it's really effective at reducing those uncertainties. Oh yeah, and there's lots of wonderful modern techniques to help you do that. But, but data is, uh, is, is really much more expensive than modeling these days. And so yeah. to, if you can use the modeling to help you with the, the monitoring and the data collection, I think it, you can accelerate your understanding much faster and better. Thank you. Completely. Yes. Yeah, it, it can all start with an informed uh, wild guess. Uh, 
Tanya. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Michael, for a, a great presentation. Um, my, my question is related to kind of the, the whole adaptive management piece of this. And I'm curious just to hear your thoughts on what you think some of the, the biggest challenges are for integrating uh, ecological forecasting and decision making. And you gave some really, you know, a couple of really good examples where it's clear that, you know, the, the models are infused in, into decision making or management processes. and and, but I'm wondering, have you, you know, really thought about some of the areas where it is more challenging, and is there, you know, some role for doing uh, co-production of these types of models with decision makers? And uh, just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, those those are great points. Um, so so Effie is a huge huge advocate of the idea of co-production, um, and so across our whole team that that, that there's a, you know, that's one of the places where there's complete consensus in in the folks in our community. Yes, that, that you need to be working with the decision maker from as early as possible in developing a forecast to make sure you're forecasting the thing that they need uh, and to get feedback. Uh, even little things design your alerts when you send them out to them like can affect the way that they interpret them. Uh, <clears throat> I would say um, kind of beyond that, uh, there, there needs to be more social decision scientists uh, thinking about this problem, we've got a few. Uh, they, they've been really great and really helped us a lot. Um, one of the things that I notice is that it, it can be hard to, uh, there's a lot of problems that I encounter where the hard part about including uh, the management components into the forecasts is actually getting good data on what's happened in the, in the past under different management options. Uh, so having the essentially the training data on on what happens under different management scenarios and and uh, that 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 can be challenging in, in some sense because in a lot of it, it isn't big data right now you know what the management decisions people make you know I, I can't see that you know, I can see it implicitly in the effects in satellite data and stuff like that uh, but I don't have the the you know the prescribed what people were planning on doing. Um, but but you know the when you get, dive into the the gory details I mean the the um, it is in some ways a, a perfect fusion though. I mean, if you go back and look at some of the original adaptive management literature, the, the idea of forecasting was kind of implicit in there. The idea that, you know, you would, you would, you know, make decisions that were contingent on learning new things, and then we would update our understanding and, and the forecasts are giving us that formal mechanism of updating our understanding and making projections under those different decision alternatives. I, I think it's kind of a perfect uh, fusion and, and I, you know, there's lots of uh, literature in the decision science, uh, lots of decision science literature on how you make decisions under uncertainty and how you can formally combine these kind of predictive models uh, with with you know user preferences and and utility functions and stuff like that to to really account for the risk that's associated with any decision. And, and I think it's actually been really informative to the scientists because a lot of scientists I know think that there's like a fixed amount of uncertainty you need to get down to for your uncertainty, for your forecast to be useful. And more often you, what you find is that uh, your forecast just needs to be better than what is currently out there to provide useful information for making a decision. And sometimes that's just doing better than chance. And it comes back to that idea, you know, when are, when are our models good enough? Um, and also, you know, even beyond that, you know, the, the forecast needs to be good enough that uh, you can make good decisions. Um, that that your for your prediction, your decision outcomes are not highly sensitive to the forecast model. Um, and and that doesn't mean you need to reduce uncertainties to zero. Uh, that often you can design have robust decision choices that that that, um, that, that will work despite the fact that there is uncertainty in the forecast. Hey, Diane. <clears throat> so I have, a, I guess, a one comment and a question, or my sort of, when do you think you're going to make it to the Weather Channel for giving an update to the state of California about whether there's uptake of carbon or efflux of carbon? You know, uh, people want to know. You know, there's going to be all these mitigation methods, and they predict the rainfall, yeah. 
Any comments on that? And then I have a more serious question. Yeah, so so I, I don't know if it's gonna show up in the Weather Channel because I'm not sure that's the, the, the prime audience for that. Um, but um, I mean, a, a number of these forecasts are showing up uh, more and more in public places. So I, I've seen the National Phenology Network's phenol national phenology forecasts on, you know, in the New York Times and, and on, on the news before, like th they're getting used. Uh, our carbon forecasts, uh, you, know, uh, you know, part of the broader carbon monitoring efforts, uh, you know, we hope to have, you know, you know something uh, Kona scale uh, operational in the next few years, and, and then it'll just be, uh, I, I think like with the weather forecast, it's gonna be decades of, of refined improvement. Uh, but yeah, it, I think we're really close on some of these things. You know, I mean, we're running them, like with the carbon forecast, we're running them every day, but we're not running them at, at a state scale yet. So it's, it's, a, it's a scaling up effort. Uh, one of those technically, we know technically what to do and how to do it. It's, it's the resources uh, to actually scale the technology up and, and scale the models up and, and just the time it takes to, to get all of this working. Well, thanks for that answer. And then my next uh, question, you know, in the uh, water resources engineering field, the, the phrase is now uh, stationarity. It's not just dead, it's a zombie. We <laughs> have to deal with the infrastructure that was built more than 50 years ago, all these aging dams. Um, you know, we have water rights that are huge constraints. Um, can you talk about how this approach can help us know what to do first? You know, how do we optimize taking out this dam versus forcing some change in how water rates are allocated? Ah, uh, um, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, in, in the abstract, I, I could say that, you know, what, what we, if you have models that, that speak to some of these things, yeah, we could, yeah, you can run them in a forecasting mode uh, under these different decision alternatives to start uh, looking at uh, possible outcomes and that we can also kind of use the uncertainties kind of in this iterative way to help you understand, you know, what, what, what information is missing that is going to be most useful for uh, further constraining the uncertainties down to the level that affects the decisions. Um, I kind of alluded to earlier, I, I think there's a really, really untapped uh, potential for adaptive monitoring to, to be able to use the fusion of the, the forecasts in, in the monitoring data simultaneously uh, to gather the information where it's most valuable. So one thought example I, I often use is if, if, you, if I have a, a, an ensemble of, of multiple models making predictions and uh, right. when they all put the same thing, collecting data at that point in time doesn't actually tell me much. But it, the second that all the different ensemble members make different predictions, that's when new, new information would actually tell me something about my competing hypotheses. Um, so you could take Take the measurements where where they're most valuable, and I think that's like example with like the Fallen Creek Reservoir smart forecast. Like, they could do an intense bout of uh, in of data collection at the times that were most critical to you know the the, the management relevant events for their system, uh, and the forecast enabled them to do that because they could anticipate when those events were going to come, and and ended up with a much more informative data set than if they just said oh, I'm going to use this legacy monitoring program that says I go out and take a sample every two weeks. You could easily miss the important events uh, using the kind of static monitoring approaches. Uh, I don't know if that I, fully- I agree with that. And, and uh, uh, in the West where the stream flow is dictated by snow melt, a lot of monitoring programs already take that into account uh, in terms cool. of tracking when snow melt and intensifying sampling during snow melt. Very cool. Okay, I see Jim's hands up. Uh, yeah, Michael, a question and a, and a comment. The question is, I was interested in this smart reservoir example from Virginia Tech, and you cited that that was work being done by three PhD students and a postdoc. So my question is, is this a topic that really has the early career researcher community jazzed? And I ask that because we, we have two postdoc positions that we're thinking about recruiting. 
And um, it, it's unclear right now what kinds of problems you're going to work on. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, I highlighted the students that were doing things. I mean, there's obviously a whole team of, of PIs above them you know, designing things. But to the broader point, is the new generation jazzed about this? Yes. I would say, we, we, you know, like with many things in ecology, there is an age gradient and a career stage gradient and excitement uh, about what things are new technologies. Um, and, and some of the most excitement is coming from early career folks. We, we have a, a student, student association within EFI. Uh, I think we really have uh, in some ways the first cohort of graduate students who view themselves as ecological forecasters is mm -hmm. that is their subdiscipline, and it's cool because they are very interdisciplinary and they they um, they are working on very different problems, but they've kind of come together and found found common cause and uh, kind of built a community. Uh, and, and yeah, they they are super excited uh, about this. And and one of the things that that has come up many times when we give talks like this in academic departments is the, the, the establishment way that we teach ecologists uh, is kind of a, a separation between you know, pure science and applied science. And to me, this win-win this of, of being able to answer scientific questions and answer them more robustly and more quickly uh, with doing decision-relevant science uh, shows that it, it's not, a, there shouldn't be, a there does not have to be a dichotomy between basic research and applied research, that we can answer some of the most pressing fundamental basic science questions in the field in these applied contexts while doing things that are, are relevant to the world. This, co this young cohort of students, even you know, up to my generation and beyond, we're in this field because we want to have an impact on the world. You know, they, they so want their research. They, they're hungry to have their research have an impact on the world. And I think too few of our graduate programs are giving them that opportunity. And they're saying, no, answer a hypothesis first. Then when you get tenure, you can have an impact on the world. That's what I was told as a grad student. And I, I think that they, they don't want to hear that anymore. Yeah. 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 And then just one, one last comment and a comment for, for balance. I, I understand why you're jazzed about short-term forecasts and how successful in apparently a short period of time you all have been. But the state of California is facing a really big decision about infrastructure to move water around in different ways that will take decades to work. And so, I mean, yes. there is still a role for longer term projections. Definitely. Yeah, I, and I, I, I never mean to imply that we need to stop doing long term projections. Yeah. It's as much as I think uh, that we need a balancing of portfolio, that the portfolio has been very biased towards long-term projections. And, you know, I, I've been doing them. I mean, I, I've been part of the earth system modeling community doing, you know, working with global carbon budget work for most of my career, uh, you know, made plenty of projections to 2100. And like I said, it, kind of tongue in cheek at the beginning, the problem is I've never been to 2100 to see if I'm any good at it. Uh, I, I, I think the balance portfolio gives us a way of, of iteratively refining the models that we use to make the long-term projections. Uh, so, so I think that, well, well short-term short, short forecast doesn't guarantee that our long-term forecasts are gonna get better. I sure, sure finds it, I find it encouraging when we get better at making short-term forecasts that, that then those models now understand the processes better for making long-term projections as well. And, and I, the thing that worries me about the long-term projections is there's no feedback mechanism to see if we're getting any better at it. I don't know if the, the projections of 2100 that I made this year are any better than the ones I made 20 years ago. Yeah. All right, well, thanks very much, uh, Michael. Let me first check to see if there's any uh, public comments on this. Edmund? There are none. Okay, there are none. Uh, really a uh, big thanks to you, Michael. I, th that was, uh, I guess that really hit the spot for us, I think in many ways. Uh, uh, I, I have uh, also a professional interest in this topic, so I will be reaching out to you individually and because uh, I want to carry on some conversations and find out particularly about the, uh, uh, the ecoforecast.org uh, operation and so forth. So I, I look for an email from me. So uh, okay. 
thanks for this opportunity. It was really great to meet all of you and, and get a chance to talk about this stuff. All right, well, thank we you very much. We actually have one public question if you have a chance, Michael. Oh, sorry. Sure. Uh, actually, never mind. The hand was lowered. Never mind. Sorry. All right. Thank you again, Michael. Thanks, so. All right, let's move on to item three, which is the Delta Chairs report. And uh, I'll be brief. The most exciting thing, of course, is that we've completed the non native species review. And uh, <clears throat> it was completed at least 24 hours before we had to make a presentation to the council. And uh, it is uh, done, finalized, available on the web. We're currently looking at ways to get further outreach on it, including uh, we've already drafted our, our two-pager, uh, Glossy. We, uh, of course, are sharing a copy of the, uh, of the report to, to the panelists that participated and, and on the council uh, distribution website, hopefully. Um, we're talking about doing a council blog on it, perhaps in a month or so, once the dust has settled and, and uh, looking for other ways to, uh, to do the outreach component of this. So any suggestions or something, we'll be happy to listen to and uh, try and get the word out on our recommendations. We gave the uh, presentation, Jay and I gave the presentation to the council on May 21st, uh, which is a formal requirement for our completed reviews. And, and uh, we got some uh, interesting questions and feedback. We, uh, they were interested in particular one council member. And uh, we, one of the recommendations we made was to develop a task force or invasive species center. And he wanted to know if there were other such examples throughout the country of such centers. And uh, so we will be providing the, uh, the council with a list of some of those and some examples that may be relevant to the Delta. There were also questions about threats of future invaders and so forth. So I think we got fairly good positive feedback. Jay and I also, as part of our presentation, raised the issue of our, uh, uh, our, our current appointment status and, and uh, the uh, uh, certain challenges we're facing with respect to that and, and formally gave them uh, 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 our concern on that topic. We did present a couple of the uh, uh, graphs, the tables that <clears throat> Lauren Hastings had given us in terms of the uh, um, stakeholder evaluation of our value in terms of uh, those bar graphs that showed we had 80 to 90 percent approval on a, a number of our uh, uh, criteria and, and, and the value of our reviews and so forth. So um, I think that's basically all I wanted to present. Uh, any comments or questions from the board? Any public comment on this, Edmund? There are none. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, topic, which is the Delta Stewardship Council report. And uh, uh, Chair Susan Tatalian will be giving that report. Good morning, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I, I am very glad to be able to be with you virtually this morning since I've been having <laughs> internet issues. So if I suddenly disappear, um, you know why. Um, so first off, thank you for the copies of the final report on, on the ISB's um, review addressing uh, the science of non-native species in the Delta. And, and uh, I, Steve already shared uh, the positive response from the council, each, each council member did receive a copy and uh, there was Quite a bit of enthusiasm, and and I think this review will will help those of us who are not scientists uh, better understand the changes needed in science related to non-native invasive plant and animal species in the Delta ecosystem. And uh, Steve pretty much covered uh, the presentation that he and Jay gave uh, to the council about the Delta ISB activities. Um, I will point out that we have some new council members. And so Dr. Brandt uh, was very good about uh, giving a quick overview of the ISB board members um, and, and their uh, backgrounds and credentials. And, and he also um, helped the new council members understand the board's role 
and its reviews of, of science focused on Delta issues and, and how the board conducts those reviews. And, um, and as Steve said, he highlighted some of the findings and recommendations and conclusions in the board's non-native species review. Um, he, uh, as he's already told you, he did share some preliminary findings from the Delta Science Program's survey about perceptions and understanding of the Delta ISB and its role. And I, I think that, that that really helped the council members, uh, especially the new ones, understand that the Delta community and others do value um, the, the Delta Independent Science Board. And, and he shared uh, some of the new approaches the board could take uh, in conducting future reviews, uh, given the current limitations. Um, and, and Jay, Dr. Lund, uh, gave a very emphatic explanation of, of how pro problematic it will be for the board to complete future reviews under the board's current appointment structure. Um, so the council members are, are quite aware of that. And, and he informed the council that there is currently a bill in the assembly that could address, could address this issue. Uh, the council um, also received an update on the Delta Levy investment strategy and some of the changes in the strategy um, since the council last considered it. And uh, most of the changes result from incorporation of new LIDAR elevation data. Uh, so instead of going into details about those changes, um, in the interest of time, I highly recommend that Delta ISB members go to uh, the website cal-span.org and, and view the recording of the May 20 and 21 council meeting. Uh, in closing, I'll say that the council deeply appreciates the contributions of the Delta ISB. You know, since the fall of 2010, the ISB has provided the council with 16 major reviews, and that's counting the recently completed non-native species review. Uh, and the ISB has also provided uh, many count, uh, detailed comment letters on, on development and implementation of the Delta plan. And, and the board has also provided reviews and comments that help shape amendments to the Delta plan and provided seven thematic uh, program reviews, plus numerous reviews and technical memos that help guide the council's work. Um, I'll share that, you know, when I joined the council in 2014, I observed that the council and the ISB have a productive and collegial, a very collegial and fun work relationship. And I'm confident um, we can get to having that a relationship. Um, I want you to know that the council values the Delta ISB and we will do what we can to support the ISB. And I look forward to the time when we can meet again in person and enjoy uh, dinners with each other again. And that's it for my report this morning. Okay, uh, thanks Susan. Any, <clears throat> any questions from any board members? Okay, <clears throat> well, thank you. Any any public comments on this, Edmund? There are none. All right, let's move on to item number five then, um, <clears throat> which is the Delta Lead Scientist Report. Uh, um, I think uh, Laurel Larson is giving us that. Yes, uh, thank you, Steve. And uh, just as a caveat, I'm home with a sick toddler, so there might be an interruption. So following on, on the coattails of Dr. Brandt's report on submitting the non-native species report to the council, uh, he has asked me to follow up with you on a, a few collaborative efforts that are related. Next slide, please, Edmund. One of those is an update on the National Center for Ecological Analysis and, and Synthesis work group that is focused on Delta food webs. Uh, this is a Delta Science Program collaboration with NCs, led on the Delta Science Program side by Pascal Gertler and Sam Bashevkin. Uh, and the focus of this 
work group is on drivers of estuarine food supply. Uh, and it's anticipated that there will be 10 to 15 agency and academic scientists participating in the synthesis. So just as some additional background, there is a recommendation in the non-native species review whereby the Delta ISB recommends the development and testing of a comprehensive spatially explicit food web model for the Delta. And this model should be Delta wide in scope tied to environmental driving forces and conditions and be available for use by decision makers. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the timing. The, the concept of this NC's work group was designed a little bit before the ISB report was drafted. And so uh, that group is not necessarily pursuing a global food web model, uh, but the analyses that are likely to be selected and refined and pursued by the working group once it convenes uh, would likely address the need articulated in the review to improve mechanistic understanding of the role of non-native species currently in the Delta. Uh, the participants, as I said before, will determine the synthesis topics, uh, but some example ideas for syntheses are uh, things like what are the key drivers of the estuarine food supply from plants to plankton to fish? How have invasive species shaped Delta communities? And how can restoration and flow management protect and enhance the food supply for fishes of management interest under future climate and management scenarios? Uh, so the dates of the NC's facilitated working group are coming up this fall. They were essentially pushed back one year as a result of COVID because NC's believes fairly strongly in the importance of convening these meetings in person. So the three weeks that are targeted are September 13th through 17th, October 25th through 29th, and no November 1st through 5th. Um, and actually, it, it sounds like at least for the September meeting, um, rather than being fully in, in person, the meeting might be a hybrid meeting. Um, and the Delta Science Program is currently in, in the process of reserving a working group space for that hybrid meeting, likely on campus at UC Davis. Uh, over the summer, the, um, the work group will begin compiling, or the, the DSP will begin compiling food web data sets with NCs that could be used in the synthesis effort. Um, and a few other brief updates are that uh, their curriculum survey is currently in IRB review at UCSB, which um, uh, which is, is needed for these efforts to fall into place. And once the survey is complete, the curriculum will be adjusted to fit the participants' interests and skill level. Um, and then... The other effort that's going on in tandem with this compilation of the list of available data sets is the discussion of which should be prioritized for publication over the summer. Uh, so Pascal and Sam uh, want you all to know that they welcome any feedback that the ISB has uh, on the basis of conducting this non-native species review or potentially the monitoring enterprise review. Uh, and in particular, if you have suggestions of data sets that they should be aware of, those suggestions are quite welcomed. So next slide, please. The other collaborative effort that I would like to provide an update on is the Delta Interagency Invasive Species Coordination Team, uh, or DISC. Uh, and what you're looking at, I apologize for all the words on this slide, it's the poster that the DISC team compiled um, for presentation at the Bay Delta Science Conference in April. Uh, but the DISC team's next quarterly meeting is on June 15th at 10 a.m. Uh, and at those quarterly meetings, the focus is on information sharing and coordination among members. Um, and, but in addition to those quarterly meetings, the DISC team also has two current working groups or two current projects that are, that are holding additional meetings. So first, a working group of DISC team members has been meeting with the goal of developing an early detection and rapid response plan for the Delta. And it's this framework that you see presented on this uh, poster from the De Bay Delta Science Conference, which was provided to me by Rachel Wigington. Uh, so the, um, the, the last meeting of this working group was in April, 2021, uh, in which they were deciding on next steps for the working group. And they're planning on meeting again June 29th at 1 p.m. Uh, they 
they have been, the, the word from Rachel is that they have been absolutely using the Delta ISB's recent review, which highlights a role for the DISC team in the, inf- the early detection and rapid response framework planning uh, in order to argue for the need for this work to be supported. So just tentatively, um, they're working towards three next steps. And one, one is to develop a one-pager memo that clearly articulates the scope, purpose, and goals of this working group uh, on the basis of the six meetings that have been convened already. Uh, so th- this effort is really focused on bringing everything together in a more coherent problem statement and giving more context to the work that they're doing. Uh, the second product that they're working towards is a, a draft Delta early detection and response uh, and rapid response coordination table, uh, which would build on a draft table that was created by a previous incarnation of the working group in 2019. Uh, This is a table that will ultimately be circulated among agencies for feedback. Um, And the information that they've pulled together so far in in the draft table put together in 2009 in the draft draft Delta early detection and rapid response framework elements is a great start for that. And then the third product they're working towards is a a draft general Delta EDRR plan. Um, And this would really grow out of the first two items where the, the one page memo could act as a draft introduction and the, ta- the coordination table would be a, a key table in the EDRR plan. And then they can use that plan to build out elements um, such as watch lists, preliminary risk assessments and possibly seek additional funding. So that was the first main focus of the group at the moment. And the second main focus is planning the upcoming 2021 Delta Invasive Species Symposium. And that's going to take place sometime in November or December of this year. Um, The Invasive Species Symposium has taken place since 2015 and has covered topics such as remote sensing and invasive aquatic weeds. They just had their planning kickoff meeting on Tuesday and there will be more details to share in the coming months. Uh, The current idea is to have this year's theme be early detection and rapid response and to build upon the work uh, that I just went through within that working group. Um, They're planning on including a traditional symposium style um, day of presentations on the first day and then hosting a workshop on the next morning to draft a, a, a version of the EDRR plan for a specific species of concern. So any questions on that before I go on? I know, Steve, this is something that you were really interested in. Yes, of course, we mentioned them in our uh, invasive species review or non-native species review. And also, uh, as you know, I made a presentation of that group and, and have attended at least a couple of their meetings. Okay, well, maybe I'll I'll reserve questions for my report in general at the end. And let's go to the next slide. Laurel. There's also a Laurel. Oh, Tom? A question. Um, What about the staffing for this? How how would that be addressed? Um, That's a that's a question I I don't know the answer to, but I could I could certainly find out and get you an answer. Okay, Kat, I need you to be quiet. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, So there's been a a lot of progress happening on the science action agenda since uh, this meeting last convened. And the most exciting development is that a draft management needs document was released through the council listserv yesterday and is now out for review. Pardon me, just one moment, please. (laughs) Okay, you need to be quiet. Okay. So this document is available um, either through the link in the listserv or at scienceactionagenda.deltacouncil.ca.gov. Essentially what this is, is it's a reorganization and a thematic grouping 
of the 65 management questions that were collaboratively identified um, through the workshops that occurred in the last year. Uh, Jessica Rudnick created this neat network diagram that you're looking at here. Each of the nodes in this diagram represents one of the top 65 management questions. The words that you see are the management themes. Um, and, and basically the way this diagram is oriented is that those, those questions are clustered uh, within these, uh, manage, these eight management themes. Now the management needs that we group the questions under are what is coloring the nodes. And so you'll see those needs written out um, in the legend on the lower left uh, and detailed further in the document. Uh, so we're not, like uh, the progress summary, we're not um, issuing a formal ask for feedback from the ISB because we, we really want uh, your time focused on reviewing um, the draft science action agenda. But if you are interested in providing feedback on these management needs, please do so through the public comment option. Um, and just as a reminder, these management needs together with the findings of the progress summary will be used to craft a discrete set of science actions that will form the core of the next science action agenda. And that's going to take place at the science actions workshop uh, July 13th through 14th. Um, and the registration is now available for that workshop. You could get there by going to the main Delta Council site and navigating to the events tab. Uh, next slide, please. I know I'm running out of my allotted time, but I also just wanted to mention that we're very close to making the announcements of the work that we're funding through the proposal solicitation. We're very excited about the range of topics and um, many of these topics are very much in line with priorities that the ISB has called for and outlined in some of your recent reports. So I won't say more than that at this point, uh, but do tune in to the June council meeting for an official announcement of these awards. And we're also starting a Delta Science Program newsletter that will be launched right after we make an announcement of these awards and will contain additional details about each of the projects that we're funding. Last slide. So I do know I'm out of my allotted time or close to out of my allotted time at this point. I just want to call your attention to a very relevant paper um, that recently came out in, um, in, in the journal Elemental, uh, Elementa Science and Anthropology. I'm not, I might be um, <laughs> misstating the name of that journal. Uh, but one of the activities that I know many of you are aware of is that the Sacramento Regional Sanitation District, uh, which has the largest wastewater treatment plant in the Delta, uh, recently upgraded its treatment to tertiary treatment. Um, and that update, uh, that upgrade came fully online in the last week of April. So what we're looking at is a dramatic shift in both the form of nitrogen, dissolved in organic nitrogen, that is put into the Delta um, a shift towards nitrate and away from ammonium. And we're looking at uh, large reductions in the, to the overall amount of dissolved inorganic ah. nitrogen that is put into the Delta. There's been a lot of debate in the literature about what impacts that will have on phytoplankton communities. And I just wanted to highlight that this is a paper in which the investigators, a team from Stanford University, uh, took samples from above and below the treatment plant and um, conducted a factorial experiment desi experimental design in which they incubated those samples under two levels of light um, and incubated uh, replicates of those samples with and without the addition of ammonium and the addition of nitrate. And what they found through this series of experiments was essentially that there was no impact on overall levels of productivity, um, depending on whether uh, nitrate or ammonium was the dominant nitrogen species uh, within the samples. And there was also no impact on phytoplankton composition. Uh, so I, I know I'm out of time. I just wanted to flag this paper because it is quite relevant to 
uh, understanding the role of nutrients in Delta food webs and understanding potential impacts of the regional SAN upgrade. And I think there's a lot to be learned as we examine the effects of this upgrade over larger spatial scales and longer temporal scales and are able to be addressed in a laboratory study. And um, these upcoming field studies will critically build on Operation Baseline, which was funded by the Delta Science Program. So I'm, I'm happy to address any questions if there's any time. I do see Jim's hand, but I can't see everyone. So I'll let someone else field the questions. Anybody have any questions? Jim? Uh, Laurel, you said that uh, $9 million was available to support uh, proposal-driven science in the Delta, and three and a half of that from the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, is the contribution from the Bureau of Reclamation targeted to specific areas, or is it completely unconstrained? So. A little bit of both, actually. We're, we are funding this group of proposals as a comprehensive package, um, but uh, Reclamation does have specific areas that they're targeting within that package that their funds are being preferentially directed to. Um, but that information is really behind the scenes. We're, we're technically funding this package of proposals as a package. <laughs> So they all went through, all the proposals went through a common review process. Uh, we convened three panels, each discussing 33 of the proposals. Um, and uh, the panels were extremely, the panels and the mail-in reviews were extremely helpful in, um, in providing relative rankings for the proposals. And then we created our final portfolio by achieving a balance of topical areas, um, science action agenda, and, and science action agenda areas from among the highest rated proposals. And I will say it was an extremely competitive process this year. Okay, anyone else have any other questions? Okay, I don't see any, so thanks, Laura. Thank you. Any, any public comment, uh, Edmund? There are none. Okay, great. We'll move on to item number six, which is the preparation for upcoming Delta meetings. And I'll just talk about the June 17th meeting, and, uh, which seems like a short ways away. We're going to uh, have our standard uh, reports. We'll have a, a seminar presentation by uh, uh, Denica Moffat on her research background, a short seminar. And then we'll get brief updates from the science needs assessment the water supply reliability and the monitoring enterprise review to see where we are on each of those. Um, and then we will uh, talk about future reviews and activities, sort of a continuation of the previous open discussion we have and, and maybe try and focus a little more structure to that discussion. I also wanna open the idea up and conversation of uh, do we wanna start thinking about uh, meeting as a group face to face somewhere and uh, field uh, field exercises and so forth field field uh, trips are uh, safe er and uh, and might be something particularly that we might think about uh, formally discussing in uh, at our June meeting any uh, comments or questions or thoughts on that or ideas Okay, well, let's uh, <clears throat> we'll keep that open and, and uh, we'll start, uh, that basically will be the structure for our uh, June, June meeting, but hopefully get to some kind of decisions on where we might go with future reviews and when we might start uh, buying our airplane tickets to our next uh, field trip. Um, okay, any uh, public comments on this, Edmund? Um, we actually do have two, actually, that panel just lowered. Um, yeah, I think Linda Smith, I'm going to give you permission to talk because I saw your email about providing public comments. I think for agenda item five, which was the Delta lead scientist report, um, 
So if you still have a public comment, please unmute and introduce yourself. Oh, hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I just to uh, my name is Linda Smith. I'm a principal resource specialist with uh, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. I'm in our um, Sacramento office, um, work with our, our Bay Delta team there. I just, I, I wasn't quick enough. I just wanted to make a, a very short comment on Laurel Larson's report um, and ex express appreciation with all that the Delta Science Program has done through their, their organizing and funding of their operation baseline um, set of studies. And, and they did that in two phases. They have another set of operation baseline studies that are underway now to, you know, that hopefully would be able to learn how um, the Delta ecosystem responds to the change in um, uh, re regional sands, uh, substantial uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrade. And then I just also wanted to mention that there are, uh, just in case the ISB members aren't aware, there's also other studies that are being funded um, by the Delta Regional Monitoring Program um, efforts. Um, and also by, uh, there's a study being funded by the state water contractors that are all looking at different questions about how different pieces, you know, how the ecosystem will be responding to the changes in loading of nutrients. So I, um, but I, I wanted to definitely express my appreciation to the Delta Science Program for, you know, getting this underway several years ago. Um, and that concludes my comment. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Any questions, Linda? Jim? Uh, yeah, Linda, the, the focus has been primarily on nutrients, but there are gonna be other changes in water quality constituents uh, through this upgraded treatment process. So are any of these studies looking at effects of, of things like uh, pharmaceuticals or emerging contaminants of concern or microplastics? I am not aware that any of the, the operation baseline focus studies are looking at those kinds of questions. I agree those are important questions, um, especially since part of regional SANS upgrade is incorporating uh, tertiary filtration and they're scheduled to do that by 2023. Um, but I know there are other efforts both through the Delta Regional Monitoring Program and possibly other places where people are looking at um, uh, constituents of emerging concern like pharmaceuticals. Um, I, I think we're probably not doing enough in those areas. So I think that's an, those are, that's an important comment, important questions. Okay, thanks again. Uh... I guess we're ready to move on to item uh, number seven. Edmund, any items for follow-up? Um, we actually have one more public comment oh. on the previous item. Mm -hmm. um, this one's from Deirdre. I'm gonna give you permission, Deirdre, to unmute. Please introduce yourself um, before you provide your public comment. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Deirdre, Deirdre Dan with California Water Research. And I wanted to give you some background on the um, Sacramento Regional Sanitation District upgrade. Um, they uh, emit, I believe, about 180 million dollar gallons a day of wastewater. And a decade ago, uh, after the interagency ecological programs, pelagic organism decline studies were completed, um, water agencies pointed to the ammonia um, from the uh, um, regional sanitation district as a co potential cause of the pelagic organism decline. It wasn't um, the um, IEP pod synthesis report ranked contaminants um, much lower. They ranked um, flow as uh, the, the top uh, concern, but it was, it was completed. There was a, uh, and a waste discharge order that was prioritized in 2010 when their permit was renewed that they had to 
uh, go to tertiary treatment within 10 years. And uh, it cost about 2.1 billion, 1.6 billion was paid for by the Clean Water Revolving Fund. Um, but now nobody is thinking that it's going to reverse the pelagic organism decline. So it probably will have some effect on the food web, but um, it's, um, I don't think anybody is thinking that it's gonna have the effects that were uh, being uh, promoted at the time. Okay, thank you, Deidre. Any questions? Okay, I think then that we can move on to item uh, seven. Yes, um, this is the item for follow-up. So I have two for today. Um, during the Delta League scientists report, um, Tom had a question about staff funding or staff staffing for the Delta Invasive Interagency and Invasive Species Coordination Team. Hopefully I got that acronym right. Um, and then Laurel will be following up with more information on that after the meeting. Um, in addition, um, during the Delta Lead Scientist report, um, Laurel uh, mentioned that the Delta Science Program is currently seeking feedback on the 2022 to 2026 Science Action Agenda draft management needs. It's currently out for public comment, so individual ISD members are welcome to provide feedback um, if you have time and interest. I mean, in addition, um, registration is now open for the Science Action Agenda workshop. And so you're encouraged to consider whether you want to attend that or not. Um, that's all I have for follow-up items, unless there's anything specific anyone would like to add for today. I, I would just add that if anyone, <clears throat> any of the board members have any ideas on uh, furthering our outreach approach with non-native species, just uh, you know, send me an email and we can follow through with that. Okay, I think we can move to item eight, which is public comments for um, items not on the agenda. Um, yes, um, we have um, one from Deirdre. And Deirdre, you have permission to unmute. Um, please unmute when you get the chance and please reintroduce yourself. Thank you. Um, Deirdre, Deirdre Dan again. I wanted to give you a report. Um, California Water Research is continuing to do extensive lobbying to fully restore funding for the Delta Independent Science Board. Um, we did have some success with the Delta Stewardship Council members at the Friday meeting. Um, it, um, Judge Frank Damrell did ask uh, the executive director um, what they were going to do to restore your compensation. Um, and Virginia Madueno who is a new council member also asked, um, as well as uh, council member Don Natoli. And the executive director uh, said that they might be looking at uh, providing salaries. Um, we don't know what that's going to be like. Uh, we did learn that mo most of the regular council members did not know that the Delta Steward, that the Delta Independent Science Board Chair had asked for staff in December, and also that you'd asked for um, staff for uh, help with ongoing reviews from contracts. Um, we have sent a letter describing that and the issues with the science board being defunded for the last fiscal year to. Uh, the heads of the budget committees um, and the Secretary of Natural Resources and Cal EPA, as well as the ISB chair and the uh, Delta Stewardship Council chair, um, because it's just not acceptable. Um, the water supply reliability review that the Delta Independent Science Board is working on is critically important um, in, in, when we're going into a mega drought like we're having now. And um, we've also hired a lobbyist and we're going to be making sure that 
the issues that you have been facing for the past year are fully addressed because um, the work you're doing is critically important. And I also want to tell you that um, I was on a conference call with the California Democratic Party Environmental Caucus uh, yesterday, and I mentioned the importance of contacting their legislators and supporting restoring funding, and there was unanimous support. You have very broad support across a huge sector, um, and I'm very sorry that um, this has turned into something political. It never should have been. Independent science is something that should always get adequate funding and had for 10 years. So thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, Deidre. We are always, uh, um, we have expressed in public and at our meetings and with the council our, our concern about the uh, our ability to achieve our missions, given our, our current situation, we are achieving it. But uh, we appreciate all the support we can get by anyone, uh, any one of the stakeholders, and that's very important to us that we are uh, that our work is appreciated. Any uh, questions? Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, <clears throat> we're meeting in a very short time, a couple of weeks. Have a. Uh, uh, Good weekend, and uh, we'll see you in June. Meetings adjourned.